certainly my eldest auntie who always had to win. And my mum and everyone else would let her too because they were respectful because she was oldest sister. Um, in January of 2017,
some of their research. And first up this morning, we've got Associate Professor Nikki Dowling and Dr Simone Rodder, who will be joining us. Would you like to come up? Thank you. I hope I've got this right. So Nikki Dowling is an Associate Professor of Psychology at Deakin University with an honorary position as Principal Research Fellow at the University of Melbourne. She is a registered clinical psychologist and has considerable experience as face-to-face -face gambling counsellor in the Victorian Gamblers Help Services. And Simone Rodder, Dr Simone Rodder, is Senior Lecturer at University of Auckland in New Zealand in the School of Population Health and an Honorary Senior Research Fellow with Turning Point in Melbourne. She's currently involved in multiple investigations involving the use of e-therapy and brief interventions for problem gambling. So welcome and thank you. On a sec, we have no lights on it. Ah, oh, now we have lights. Okay. <coughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Nikki and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and respect to elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to thank the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation for having us here today um, and for bringing us together in such a wonderful place. Um, I myself uh, uh, born and bred in Geelong and um, so it's a treat to be back in Geelong today. Are there other people here from Geelong? Hello. And kia ora also to my New Zealand colleagues that are here. So um, I was reflecting when I, I was coming here today that actually 26 years ago I um, spent New Year's on the pier here, the Geelong folk, do you remember this? So there used to be this huge hangar here. This building was not here 26 years ago. Um, and it was like a cargo, cargo depot where the, um, the boats would um, unload their cargo. And they used to create the whole thing into a, a New Year's Eve celebration where thousands and thousands of people would attend. Um, back then and compared to now, there were no poker machines then, 26 years ago in this state. Um, there was no internet, there was no mobile phones, there were very few personal laptops, there were no tablets and there was no Wi-Fi. And so I think just putting that in context of one of the reasons why we're talking about this today and about talking about different ways of reaching people. Um, so Nick and I would like to, um, we'll play a bit of a tag team here today. Um, I'll cover a sort of a broad overview of e-mental health and um, the state of online self-directed programs. Nikki will then report on the top line findings from a project funded by the VRGF aimed at developing and evaluating online self-directed cognitive behavioural um, program for gambling, Gambling Less for Life. And she will also be talking on the translation of that program for the VRGF website and um, also some real cutting edge interventions. Should acknowledge at this stage that um, VRGF are pretty much, um, not pretty much, they are the leaders in funding this type of research in Australia for gambling um, and most of the research that you're hearing about today have been, has been funded by VRGF. Um, and we're going to conclude with a discussion on the integration of online self-directed interventions and how you might consider using these in your, your practice. So um, this is really just a broad setting the scene to get started. So internationally, there is a conference and an association called the International Society for um, Research in Internet Interventions. This is a really very large body of um, experts that meet around the world uh, every couple of years. Um, they've been operating for some 15 years. In the field of internet interventions, their plan is to implement and disseminate intervent internet interventions to anyone, anywhere. Um, when it first started some 15, 20 years ago, it was about disseminating internet interventions to people in a local area. Now it is about getting these interventions into China, India and other places. There, there's large populations that can't access these, um, this type of treatment. The issues around this, though, is a willingness to be able to share resources and to disseminate resources. So, for example, in um, Australia and New Zealand, we have services that are offered online and programs online, but I don't know of any that actually cross over between Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that is not to scale. New Zealand is a little bit smaller. <laughs> At one stage, it was really big. <laughs> um, 
So in terms of this dissemination, what limits dissemination is the amount of person involvement. So when we're talking about person involvement, um, we need people involved to help people engage with these programs and stay connected. But every time you add a person to an internet intervention, it means that you can only disseminate it so far. So what researchers are doing is looking at different ways that you can add um, people to the intervention, such as peer-to-peer -peer support, coaching or guidance that can be provided by a, um, a non-professional. Um, so there's issues around registration once you start talking about covering Australia and New Zealand, for example. Uh, a key issue in this area, though, and, and um, one of the benefits of this type of intervention is the lowered barriers to accessing services. So we know that um, barriers such as shame, stigma and accessibility of services is a reason people don't come to our face-to-face um, -face services. And so online interventions overcome that in terms of people can usually access anonymously. They often don't have to give their name. Um, they don't have to travel anywhere. They can do it at home. Um, they can do it when their partner's gone to bed. So they, they can engage in services without other people knowing. But with these lower barriers to treatment are um, increased attrition. So attrition is when people stop using the service and they kind of don't tell you why or that they've had enough. Um, and so there's this issue about how do you manage um, getting more people in but managing keeping them in long enough to get the treatment that we think that they need. So um, uh, uh, before I move on to the gambling research, a final issue that um, Nikki will also talk to today is about building interventions that are optimised. Now, what this means, at the moment when we do CBT, we will pretty much deliver um, every or as many tricks and tips and methods that we've got in our toolbox to someone and hope that some part of it makes a difference. We don't evaluate the components of a CBT program at the moment. Online interventions allow us to do that. It allows us to say, do, um, does doing a pros and con cons exercise make any difference to treatment outcomes? Does doing um, challenging cognitions make any difference to treatment outcomes? And we're able to design experiments where we can test that. Now, the idea of doing this is that you deliver and you develop programs that are the, the, only the essence the person needs to make that long-term behaviour change. They don't get everything else that they don't then access and drop out of. And so this is where the field is at the moment. And the question is not whether they work, because there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of randomised trials in this um, stuff that we're talking about, not in gambling, um, but how do they work and what are the components that are effective? So um, when we're looking at gambling, this is a, um, a, a review that um, myself and Nikki and colleagues undertook um, last year, where we examined the content of 46 randomised controlled trials for gambling. This is all of the randomised controlled trials for gambling up until last year. Um, and one of the findings from that is that around 75% of interventions were delivered by face-to-face -face mode um, and around 15% um, by telephone, which is mostly David Hodgins' work in the UK. Uh, UK? David's moved to the UK. Uh, in Canada. And around 5% um, um, involved internet delivery. Um, this is a really great resource, this paper, if you're interested in what actually is in our interventions that we base our programs on. So this is the evidence. Um, this is a, um, a snapshot of just the internet-based research for gambling that is on the Australian Institute of Family Studies website. And this was, um, we did this a couple of years ago. And so it goes through all the technical options that you could consider and prevent, presents the research. So we know that online information through websites, there's been no studies about that, about whether it's effective, how it's effective, um, who accesses it. Um, with online screening, there's been some studies now that are using personalised normative feedback. Does anyone know what that is? I do. Um, <laughs> sorry, I really try not to make jokes, although it's so nice to be in Australia because my Kiwi colleagues, when I teach in, um, in New Zealand, they don't like Australian jokes, I find. And so I have to really temper myself and be quite calm. Um, 
Right. So um, the uh, normative feedback means someone takes the PGSI, for example, and then they get feedback on how their score compares to someone of the same age or gender or the same location or if they're a student for drinking, for example. And so those, those interventions look like they're having really good outcomes. Um, in terms of forums and message boards, there's been a couple of descriptive studies. Um, but for the most part, most of the research has been on online self-directed programs, and that's what Nikki's going to talk to you about today. So these are um, programs that have a, um, usually modules that people step through and they're typically CBT. Most of that research you see there is from Europe with one study in Canada. Um, in terms of mobile um, applications, there's been a descriptive study of mobile apps by Michael Savick at Turning Point. Um, up until this point, no interventions looking at SMS. A descriptive study looking at email, a couple of descriptive studies looking at online chat with one that's looked at changes in distress as a result of doing online chat, and no studies looking at video conferencing. So I would locate gambling research about eight to ten years behind the rest of the field in terms of internet interventions and the amount of research that we've done to demonstrate whether these work. So as a way of trying to address this, VRGF funded this project for, for a couple of years ago where we recruited people through Gambling Help Online and looked at what they accessed and um, whether that made a difference over a 12-week period. So this is the proportion of people that accessed each of these services. Uh, you see most people access the website. So we then wanted to know if that makes a difference. Now, it turns out that people access a bunch of stuff. And in fact, they access 26 different combinations of services. So the most frequent combination was a web, looking at the website information, jumping online and reading the forum or contributing to the forum, and then um, trying a self-help module. So the self-help module was very brief, and that's, they're on the Gambling Help Online website, um, of five to ten minutes. Um, and you can see that after that, the next most frequent um, combination was chat and website. So very few people did one thing. So this is telling us a little bit that if someone comes through an online site, they're probably going to engage in a few different things. We were then interested in whether it made a difference over 12 weeks, and this uh, you can see here, um, we grouped them with um, if a person engaged in a person-to-person -person exchange, such as chat or email, um, the top line is chat or email, so low intensity, versus um, one of the self-directed options. And what you see is everybody went down um, in terms of their gambling severity um, from baseline to four weeks, um, more than half. And then the people that um, talked to someone stayed to maintain that change. Um, and the people that engaged in the self-directed without talking to someone went up slightly. Um, and so that was after one session or coming in from that one occasion. So we were also interested in whether we could look at whether um, SMS made a difference as well, whether we could add that to the suite of services. So when I say suite of services, I'm talking about the other five things that Gambling Help Online offers at the moment and whether we could add SMS. So we did a, um, a very elaborate study. It, it required changing processes with the service. Um, setting up warm referrals because we offered a call back if a person text help to us, it would tr it would prompt a warm referral back into the service. Um, we delivered two text messages a week for a 12-week period um, and, and did this follow-up over a couple of years. And very disappointingly, it made no difference. <laughs> um, and so you can see here that um, it, it, there wasn't a difference between receiving the text messages and not. Um, so after consulting colleagues, and the, um, this, the team that worked on this was um, Nikki Dowling and Professor Dan Lubman from Turning Point, as well as myself, and um, we came to the conclusion that gamblers actually were doing a lot of things at the same time. So not only looking and engaging in a lot of content on the website, they were also engaging in face-to-face -face activities, they were engaging in self-directed options. So typically when we think about help seeking and people that are um, coming to our service, we usually say, um, when we've asked people, have you ever sought help for your gambling, the proportion, and thinking by yourself here, like the proportion that usually say, yes, I've sought previous help, is typically we talk about 20%. So, and I've spouted that out about, over the last 10 years, quite a lot, 20%. With this study, we asked people, 
have you used any of these 14 options in the, um, to, to manage your gambling? And when we did that, we got a um, response of 70%. And if we included the self-directed options, so the ones at the bottom, the response was 93%. And so we've kind of set up these services on the basis that we're getting all these new people that aren't really doing anything about their gambling before they come in. But these online help seekers are doing a whole lot of stuff. So we, start, we need to start to think about treating people for where they're at and that they're on their own journey and we're just part of that journey. Um, so that was, a, that was a real learning for us. So these are some of the issues that are, are, are talked about in the field more broadly. And now Nikki's going to take you deeper into the gambling field and the interventions. So I think you could just hold your applause to the end. It's like being at, you know, a, you know the, um, when you go to a classical concert and you never know whether, oh, to applause yet, just wait to the end. <laughs> this is where I nudge her out of the way. That was very restrained for Simone, by the way. Very well done. Um, so I'm a face -to I was trained as a face-to-face -face counsellor, as a clinical psychologist. Um, I won't tell you exactly how long because that would give my age away. 20 odd years ago. Um, and at that time, it was only face-to-face. -face. So we never got trained in any other modality other than face-to-face. -face. Um, I now teach into um, the postgrad degrees at universities. And the situation's fairly similar, despite all this information that Simone's given you in related fields, psychological and addiction fields. Um, so what I found working in that space is exactly what Simone was talking about, that people, you know, when you ask people what they're doing in face-to-face, face-to-face is kind of a last resort for a lot of people. You know, they've tried a lot of things. They've frozen their ATM cards in the freezer and, you know, all sorts of wonderful things, inventive ways that people come up to to actually manage their gambling behaviour. Um, so I agree with Simone that that's, that's not unusual to see. But we're not really harnessing, I guess, the, the, the technology that's available at the moment to deliver deliver these empirically based interventions on a wider basis. And so that's why I started to get into this space. Um, we've, I'm, I'm going to spend some time today just talking about some illustrative examples, just to give you a feel of what some of these interventions look like and what they can do and how people might be able to use them. Um, so the first... Um, study that I'm going to talk about was funded by the Foundation um, and it was several years ago so again they were sort of at the forefront of funding in this area um, and it's really the, one of the first, well, the first um, online interventions for gambling behaviour in Australia. Um, so we called it Gambling Less for Life. The reason we did that was we, we sort of pilot tested and user tested some of the names and essentially people wanted gambling and reduction of gambling. We didn't want any indication that it was about stopping gambling because we wanted people to be able to go in with the idea of reducing their gambling or, or setting limits on their gambling rather than abstinence, um, which is consistent with our public health framework in Australia. We put the full life on the end of it, we don't often use it, but it's there to engage with that positive aspect, um, that you're actually improving and you're not just recovering from a state of deficit, that you're actually maybe moving into a state of well-being. Um, so we wanted that really positive movement and flavour to it. Since we developed Gambling Less, there are several other versions of, of, of mobile and online interventions that we've been developing, so I'm just going to give you a really quick snapshot today of some of those. Um, so Gambling Less was originally funded by the Foundation and it was um, a range of researchers from Deakin University, was Deakin University in Turning Point, um, and um, the Statewide Gambling Service um, in um, South Australia. The idea here was to really focus on the content rather than the interactivity. We wanted to develop a, a cognitive behavioural intervention that emulated the intensity and the depth of a face-to-face -face intervention. Um, but we, we had the idea in our heads that we would do sort of the hard work in that instance and then we'd start developing more tailored and brief interventions and that's exactly where we're at at the moment. We're sort of pulling stuff away from gambling less and into really targeted and specific kinds of interventions. So we had three phases in Gambling Less. The first one was to develop the program in and of itself. Um, the second was to actually trial it. So we use what's called a pragmatic trial. And a pragmatic trial is basically like a randomised controlled trial without the rigour. So the idea is to actually test it in real life conditions. Um, we compared the effectiveness of the program delivered under two different conditions with and without practitioner guidance. So GSD in these slides mean guidance self-directed and PSD means pure self-directed. Um, we recruited 11 guides from Gambling Help Online and the Victorian Face-to-Face -face Services to act as our guides, and the guidance was done by email um, for those who received guidance. 
The third phase was actually because it's a new program and a new idea in this space, we were wanting to explore the acceptability and the feasibility of that. And we did that um, with both the participants and the guides, um, and we used both qualitative and quantitative methods to evaluate that. So the program basically was four different modules based on the therapeutic component. And you'll see we've actually changed this model a little bit with our redevelopment. Um, but essentially we had four different modules, 13 to 15 activities each. Each module was designed to take approximately one to two hours to complete. Um, and we had a whole range of different interactive activities, short videos, audio files, questionnaires, animations, those sorts of things. Um, you'll see that the first model is really the motivational interviewing model, mo module. Um, and this was um, so that people could get a better understanding and awareness of their gambling behaviour and how they might want it to change in the future. The second module is really the behavioural module, so the behavioural therapeutic module. Um, and in this module, participants identified sort of skills and strategies that they either knew before or hadn't implemented or needed to learn in order to maintain and stabilise their gambling. The third was um, the cognitive model. A module, and the, the cognitive model module was one of the most in-depth modules around cognitions that we had. Most of these self-directed programs literally do one activity related to cognitions. We wanted to give a much more um, in-depth look at the cognitive work um, in this space to see whether you know people liked it, were interested in it, or really struggled with it. And um, we sort of landed somewhere in the middle. We we recognise they need to do some of it, but maybe not as much as we delivered in gambling less. And the fourth module was a relapse prevention module. So this was like the idea of people trying to get an understanding of all the factors and situations that lead up to a relapse so that they can maintain their goals in the future. As I said, we used a pragmatic pilot trial in phase two. Um, we had 256 gamblers, 258 gamblers approach, um, but 206 were randomised and randomly allocated to either that pure self-directed or guided self-directed condition. Um, interestingly, the participants that we had through were mostly male. They were mostly under the age of 40. They were mostly born in Australia and they were mostly employed full time. So you're starting to get an image of the type of people that are attracted to this type of intervention. They most commonly reported having issues with EGMs, racing and sports betting, and 96% were problem gamblers on the problem gambling severity index. Um, this was a bit disappointing, I think, for the foundation, because I think there was a hope that maybe some lower risk and more at risk people would be attracted, but it's still clear that people quite at the severe end of gambling behavior, problem gambling behaviour were still being attracted to this kind of intervention. So it's important for us to know. All right, in terms of outcomes, um, the main measure we used was um, gambling symptom severity, um, using something called the gambling symptom assessment scale. Um, this is a good measure because it measures gambling problems or gambling severity intensity, I guess, over a one week period. Okay, so you can use it over and over and over again, pre, post, etc., all the way through. Um, we can see from that figure there that we had um, an improvement in gambling symptom severity at both the eight week and the 12 week follow ups. Um, and, but there was no difference between those two conditions in terms of the guided guidance that was delivered. Um, in relation to what we call clinical significance, and this is basically any meaningful change that would occur in the individual's life, um, we identified people, um, and there's a scientific way to do this, but we essentially classified them as recovered, improved, unchanged or deteriorated. And really the results are pretty good. So 50% of people by the 12 week follow up uh, were recovered, 14% were improved, 34% were unchanged and just under 3% were had deteriorated. Um, Again, there was no difference, though, between the PSD and the GSD groups, so although there were trends towards the GSD um, groups doing better. OK, I'm not going to spend too long on this. And um, we had a whole bunch of other what we called secondary outcome measures. So they were the things that we might reasonably expect to change as, as the intervention went along. Um, there, were almost no, there were almost no differences between the PSD and GSD conditions on almost all outcome measures on either, um, either follow-up, the eight or the 12-week follow-up. But the GSD group did report lower gambling frequency at 12 weeks and more low-intensity help-seeking at eight weeks. So that was more the online um, email, etc., type interventions, telephone interventions. But in terms of improvements across time, overall, the program produced significant improvements in gambling urges, gambling frequency and psychological distress, even though psychological distress wasn't specifically targeted by the intervention. There were also significant improvements in gambling expenditure and quality of life at the eight-week, but not the 12-week follow-up. 
In our third phase, we wanted to see what participants thought. What did, users, uh, what did guides think? Like, what was their perception of it? Was it interesting? Was it engaging? Was it useful? Was it helpful? Um, like most online um, self-directed interventions, we had low engagement with the project, with only one third of participants that went through the trial actually accessing um, an intervention module. Um, all of the activities and all the modules were available to people, um, and we hoped, we had the idea that people would kind of just pick between them. They'd sort of look and go, oh, that sounds interesting, I'll just pop in there. But what we actually found was that people started at the start and they progressively went through. So we sort of see really good um, um, use, use, use of the early modules and activities and people dropping off as people move towards those later modules. So this is something we're trying to rectify in our later work. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Um, we asked participants um, what was the most helpful activity, and they identify coping with lapses, the benefits of gambling less, deciding on a goal, like what, what do I actually want to do here? Do I want to quit, quit or cut back? And using a, a calculator to actually um, uh, calculate how much that they had spent. We used a questionnaire to explore the acceptability of the program in all sorts of ways. So this is a specifically designed for internet um, interventions. What was it about the intervention that people liked? Um, the majority of participants positively evaluated the program, particularly in terms of the, its comprehensiveness. The internet is the mode of delivery, so people liked that it was available on the internet. The ease of use and the credibility of the program. And that's something we found in the interviews as well. People actually liked it being tagged with university um, labels and things like that because they felt like it was coming from a credible source. Um, P uh, participants were also positive about whether they would use the program again, the convenience of using it, and the usefulness of the information that was provided in it. Interestingly, few participants, right down the bottom, were concerned about their privacy when using um, the intervention. We also asked people about, well, now you've done the intervention or parts of it, so what else do you need? Right, so the idea here is we're, we're really just trying to find out, are we doing what people want? Right? Is there something else that they need more of? Um, you know, is there something that we missed that they, they actually want help with? Um, and so we're going across in terms of what they wanted. Okay, so the ones down the bottom they didn't want help with, the ones at the top they did. So you can see that people wanted to learn some skills to keep from returning to gambling, even though that was an entire module. But again, people probably didn't get to it because they started at the start and went through. They wanted to improve their physical health, they wanted to learn how to relax better, finding enjoyable ways to spend my free time, and overcoming boredom. So a lot of these things were actually inbuilt into the program, but they may not have been accessed by the participants or they may just not have been enough work in that area for them. Um, or they still had some way to go. Um, what they didn't want was advice about financial problems, wanting to stop their alcohol or tobacco use and wanting help with legal problems. We also conducted um, participant and guide interviews, really in-depth interviews, um, to try to get a sense of what that experience was like using the program. Both groups generally agreed the program was helpful and the participants also thought it was really effective. Both participants and guys po positively evaluated the program content, the look and the feel of the program and the privacy aspects. But there were some mixed views about the intensity. Like I said, this was a really comprehensive program. So some participants reported that they felt challenged by that content. Some people felt a bit overwhelmed by it. So again, this is where that tailoring stuff that, and optimization stuff that um, Simone was talking about comes into play. Getting what you need when you need it. Um, Regard the, regardless of whether they receive guidance, all participants indicated that some kind of support or encouragement is important. There was agreement that some form of support should be included in future um, iterations of the program. Participants who received guidance indicated that they received st relatively strong personal bonds with their guides, but it was the guides who expressed frustration. So they reported that they were frustrated with the low levels of engagement by the participants, um, and they were also frustrated with the limitations of their role. They were therapists. They wanted to do something therapeutic. And in this intervention, we weren't letting them. <laughs> we were really restricting it to a supportive type role, um, and they weren't allowed to get in there with their own therapeutic orientation and kind of work with that and so there was a fair bit of frustration from the guides around that. Um, guides also wanted more information about the ways that the participants were accessing the program. Which modules were they doing and how were they doing it and when were they doing it and all those sorts of things. Although they did get some of that information, they wanted more. 
Okay, so um, both users, sorry, both the participants and the, and the guides um, recommended that this type of service needs to be incorporated into standard service delivery. Um, and we, in the report that we wrote, we sort of produced a whole bunch of different recommendations for improvement and clinical implications. But the three that I kind of walked out with in terms of redeveloping the program was that the program could be developed into sort of brief and, and targeted interventions, so giving people what they want. Um, developing a more individualised and tailored approach according to people's needs and including additional strategies to in increase that participant engagement. Okay, so it may be things like SMS that Simone was talking about before, enhanced interactivity, sort of more user-friendly. So that leads us very nicely into um, the redevelopment of Gambling Less. Um, so we have recently redeveloped Gambling Less for translation to the Foundation's website. Um, again, the goal was to develop a brief, targeted and more engaging intervention for people who are experiencing gambling-related harm. So in this program, you can see our modules look very different. So we have six modules here instead of four, and they're not based on the therapeutic content, they're based on the person's journey. So where are they at? So at they, are they at the point where they're just really just starting to think about their gambling, not really convinced it's a problem, people are kind of expressing concern, but we're not quite there yet, all the way through to, you know, I've had a gambling problem, I've sort of got it under control, I think I've got it under control, but I don't want this to happen again in the future, preventing relapse, okay? So, and everybody in between, all right? So this is where what we're trying to do is actually start getting people to think about what they want from the program and then directing them to the modules or interventions that are most appropriate for them. So each of those modules will be discrete, but gamblers will be encouraged to connect between the modules. So they might endorse something in one activity and then something will pop up and say, hey, you know, you might like to try blah, you know, because you said this. Um, so there's all different interconnections between all the different activities within the program. It is anticipated that people won't start from the start, hopefully, and go down. Not all gamblers will want everything in this program. Okay, so we again we sort of we use in face to face we use attrition. We're not talking about attrition here. We're talking about people using what they want when they want it. Okay, so here's some illustrations. This is some prototypes of the home page. Within each module, gamblers will be presented with a range of about four to six activities. So you see the modules are much smaller, much more condensed than in the original Gambling Less. And they can choose from the list. Once an activity has been completed, they'll get sent back to the module home page. Once all the activities in a module have been completed, they'll get sent back to the home page and if they haven't sort of been redirected elsewhere. Um, the main homepage and the help seeking options will be available all the way through the program regardless of where the person is at um, so that if they want to escalate the kind of support that they're getting they can do that and connect into different kinds of services. All right, so one of our views with Gambling Less suite of, of interventions is we don't care what kind of support people get, we just want them to get what they need. All right, so we're not sitting there trying to say, no, 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 you just have to stay within our program. We're saying, no, if you want to go and do this, go and do this. Go and get some help. Have you thought about this? So help seeking is threaded all the way through this intervention. Okay, so let's quickly have a look at the modules. The first one is Understanding My Gambling, that's the assessment and feedback module. So the exercises in that module give a, um, gambling behaviour, uh, assess gambling behaviour and help gamblers explore their motivations in terms of their motivation, sorry, their gambling in terms of motivations, triggers and harms. The second module is more that motivational interviewing type module. It's, it tries to help gamblers be clear about the benefits of change, get more motivated and understand their own goals. The third module is getting immediate control over my gambling. So this is for the space for people who kind of go, look, I want to, I want to change, I'm, I'm ready for change. I just haven't got what I need to do that internally. I don't have strategies and skills to do this. And so what we try to do here is almost put external controls on the gambling. So something like self-exclusion would be a good illustration of that, right? It's not you controlling something, something sort of outside is controlling the gambling behaviour, but it does give you, so it's not ideal, but it does give you this breathing time and space to kind of get into that other space where you can learn those skills and strategies. Um, we focus here on limiting access to money and venues, the two things you need to gamble, um, or computers. Um, but also, if you do decide to gamble, resisting social pressure to gamble and some guidelines to gamble safely if that's what you decide to do. So again, not an abstinence model, not, not people saying, if you do find yourself in a venue, maybe you might like to think about doing X, Y and Z. Okay, taking action to gamble. This is the skills and strategies based one. This is for people who say, look, I've got external control, but I need that. I need those skills and strategies to be able to manage it and to maintain it. Um, 
they can stabilise their gambling using this stuff and helping people to stick to whatever gambling goal they've selected. We also have some prototypes of the activities within this module. So this is an example of the, the budgeting activity in the, um, in the, the, the module. The, on the left, there's an overview of the information that's been entered into the budget. In the middle is how a person can add their additional expenses. And on the right is a summary of how much people expe people's expenses are relative to their income. Also within this module is a cognitive activity. In this activity, people indicate how much they endorse particular gambling-related cognitions. They're then asked to challenge these beliefs using an activity called Take Your Court to Thought. So take your thought to court. I knew I'd stuff that up. <laughs> take your thought to court. So it's basically getting people to actually look at the evidence, but in a sort of kind of interactive type fun way. On the right is a prototype of the enjoyable activities exercise where people list alternative activities that they find pleasurable. Just the last two modules, just to give you an idea. This one's coping with gambling urges, and we've actually used this module to springboard a different intervention, which I'll talk about in just two seconds, really briefly. Um, and this is for people who are having trouble with urges. They're really struggling to manage urges, and it gives them quite a few different activities that they can use, and over and over and over again if they want to, while they, yep, while they, um, while they're having one. Um, gambling less for good, again, people who have recovered but want it to stay that way so that they can avoid any lapses in the future. Okay, really briefly, I just want to talk about just-in-time interventions. Um, we've used that coping, er coping with urges module to develop these just-in-time adaptive interventions. They target factors that can rapidly change over time, just as, such as behaviour, moods, thoughts and location and social context. And this is where the tailoring comes in. So we can use what's called an ecological momentary assessment or an EMA. Um, and we basically say to people, so how's, how's your urge going? Okay, how, how strong is it? And people who endorse having a gambling urge can then be delivered an intervention right on the spot in the moment that they're having the urge. Um, Just-in-time interventions are quite complicated, but they do appear quite simple to the people using them, and they've got really good efficacy in a whole range of different other um, mental health and physical health areas. And this is the prototypes of the um, Curb Your Urge app, which is a just-in-time intervention. Um, so people get that intensity rating, and then they get a whole range of different activities. So on the left is just a simple, you know, go and do something. Like, what, what can you do? And we we'll get people to start thinking about some other things that they might like to do. On the right is an urge surfing app, and they can just play that over and over and over again if they want to until the urge dies down. And finally, um, some tips to change your thoughts, okay? Trying to do cognitive therapy in a snapshot. Um, there is another cognitive module as, uh, app as well, activity. Um, and a reminder card. So again, people, just to give them that sense of, yes, these are the rules that I can follow when I'm having an urge. I'm just going to hand over to Simone really briefly, and she'll just wrap everything up for us. Well, I thought I was going to talk for a while, Nikki. But... <laughs> um, so um, we're almost um, um, towards the wrapping up part. So when we're thinking about all the things that you've heard today and all the different options, I think the place to start in terms of your own use of these is to think about the aims of your, your intervention and then select the technology you want to meet those aims. So <clears throat> frequently we start with, oh, let's do SMS, or let's do email, let's do this, without really thinking through what it is we're trying to achieve with this. Um, so for instance, um, we could use all these different types of technology along the top here, including the internet interventions that Nikki's just described to us, and we could use that for a whole range of different purposes. So we could use that to manage a wait list, we could use it as a brief intervention for people that aren't ready to engage in longer term treatment, um, we could use that with treatment, we could use it as a relapse prevention, and as Nikki said, these programs are about relapse prevention and also for follow-up and aftercare. Um, so as by way of example, if you're interested in reaching a population uh, due to office hours and you want to, want to engage people on the weekends or overnight, that's not a time where you'll be able to respond to it using technology, right? So you might want to think about something like email as a way of the way that um, your client can write to you at night but you don't need to be there to respond. Um, another way is to think about using these for follow-up and aftercare where at the moment after someone's finished an episode of care, we have stepped care model up but this, um, not so much coming back down and 
people are kind of left hanging in some ways. And so SMS, for example, we're in New Zealand, is piloting a 26-week um, trial of using SMSs as part of post-treatment. Um, post so that's a way of doing that. So um, it really pays to know what it is you're trying to do and then get some research around, well, are you actually going to get the people you want by doing this? So this is um, some research we did on telephone-based intervention. People said they use it for convenient time and location. If they used it during the day, it was around privacy issues. If they used it after hours, it was because they couldn't get to a face-to-face -face service. So this is just about getting some information about what might be the best way. In terms of supporting internet therapy that you've just seen presented, you can be a source of information information for that. You can um, provide guidance and instructions on which modules that your client might be, be best to work on. You can support and encourage that change and you can also review the progress by perhaps offering outcome measures before and after your client engages in this. Um, in considerations of, it, of um, uh, bringing that into your service, I think there's, um, there's a whole bunch of considerations and, and I understand you'll have access to these PowerPoints, so I won't go into these in detail at the moment, but thinking about who you're trying to target, what technology you want to use and what type of intervention will you apply. So that means that if you're trying to target people outside business hours, using instant chat is probably not going to be your option. Email might be a better option. Um, if you're trying to target young people, then having an appointment-based service that where they have to provide all identifying details is probably not the service that you want if you're targeting younger people. You probably want something that's going to be more anonymous and something that's going to be more immediate, such as chat. We need to think about how you're going to let people know about the service and how they're going to be referred to it and when they access the terms and conditions. So what typically happens is if we, we want to do a brief intervention um, or opportunistic intervention, might set that up but not think about when do people actually get the information on the limitations of the service um, and how would that happen. We need to think about when the screening is conducted. So the single biggest predictor of whether someone will go well on online interventions is if they think it will work. And so we need to be asking, do you think that online will work for you? And if it's yes, then we can proceed. If it's no, then that's not an option at this time. And then I, I thought it would be helpful to think about some of the whys are we doing this. And so that's part of tailoring what the service would be. So to conclude, the, the real frontiers at the moment in e-mental health is blended interventions. And this is where we use treatment programs that use elements of both face-to-face -face and internet-based interventions. So from our perspective here, it is, uh, if we use face-to-face -face focus, it means um, complementing, complementing or replacing part of that interaction or that um, episode of care with an internet-based option. So what this might look like is the person comes in for a 50-minute treatment session, they might do half an hour talking therapy, and they might do 20 minutes of a CBT module. Or you might set it up so they do um, one, two appointments a week. One of those appointments is working through a CBT module. The other appointment is the talking therapies. The benefit for you as a clinician is if you don't enjoy doing um, some parts of CBT, you could just use that in your practice. So if it's the challenging the erroneous cognition, again and again and again that you don't enjoy where you can help your client work through that and an evidence-based program. You can do that um, before the person engages in treatment or you could do it after as well and after in terms of the urge management module would be a great thing to offer people. So I think the important thing here is to not think of it as an adjunct or homework but that it's integral in that treatment plan because clients don't do homework. And if you're thinking of it that way, you're just adding another thing that people won't do. So it's about integrating this in the treatment plan. So compared with standalone and face-to-face -face, uh, face -face therapy, blended therapy saves clinician time, leads to lower dropouts, better in, um, symptoms for our clients, and helps maintain those changes over a longer period. So this is new. Um, it, has, it is still being evaluated. So we wanted to leave you with a bunch of resources, and these were just some of them. Um, and these are the resources. And so there's a great chapter in a book that came out last year that um, steps you through the different options across these different modalities as well, um, as well as the two fact sheets on the AFES website. Nikki and I are always um, available to send you information or um, assist you with any of the things we've talked about today as well. So thank you so much for um, today. Thank you. Um, 
I know that we're just slightly running over time, but I don't want to miss this opportunity for face-to-face -face with the researchers. So if we can probably take a couple of questions, if people would like to ask anything of Nikki or Simone. I'm over here. At Hi. the back, yeah, thank you. Hi, Janine. <laughs> Technology, hey? It's not working. Hi. Hi. Would you like to come up here? Hello? Hi. Hi. Thank you, uh, Simone and uh, Nikki, very much for that. It was, it was, that was really what was relevant um, clinical presentations attended in some time. So I question, um, one of the things that I'm really thinking a lot about is uh, stigma um, and problem gambling and rapport. So I was interested that so many of the participants were people who scored really highly on the problem severity index. And if you considered around uh, when you designed this and what your uh, thoughts are based on the Sorry, I'll just I'll, I'll address the rapport thing because I actually think that's really interesting. When we started this program, um, Simone said, "I want to measure therapeutic alliance with non-guided participants," and I went, "What are they rapport? What, what are they developing rapport with?" And she said, "This is an engagement. This is an interaction." Um, and we actually found very good levels of engagement um, with um, with the program in and of itself. So I think there is as, if, as long as that animation and that interactivity is there in terms of rapport, I think that's really important. Um, in, and in terms of reducing stigma with us, we spent a lot of time working on our language. We spent a lot of time, um, you know, it went back and forth many, many, many times across the course of the investigation and it's still being refined now in terms of how do we get these sort of relatively complex therapeutic uh, concepts across, um, but using really destigmatised and really easily accessible language, um, in and of apart, apart from concept-wise, um, it was a lot about how we communicated with the client. Do you want to yeah, no, any other questions? Looking for hands. No, well, as um, mentioned, Simone and Nikki are here through the rest of today, and um, I'm sure if you have do, do have questions, they'd be more than happy to speak with you about their research. I found it fascinating just watching that the development of the, the process through to what we got at the end. It was really helpful, I think, to understand how, how the program came to be. Um, so thank you again. If we can just welcome and thank our speakers here. Okay, we now have another very exciting element for um, this morning's presentations. Uh, we're going to welcome three sides of the coin to uh, speak with us. I'm sure many people here have seen three sides of the coin in, in some shape or form in different places. Um, but they use theatre to, to tell us a story. We're going to welcome this morning Judy Avasar and Catherine Simmons from Link Health. Um, they're looking at it, it's an inspirational gambling harm prevention project that's been touring the state for three years now. They utilise the power of the lived experience voice and creative theatre to develop vignettes about gambling that's going to be acted out by people who have direct experience of gambling harm. I think we're waiting for one more... Oh, but okay, we're lowering the blinds. Yeah, we're ready? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't need the lectern. <laughs> <laughs>